today's topic is a topic that uh, one particular entity will not like us to listen, and that is the devil, because it exposes uh, uh, his works, which have been destroyed by Christ on the cross. So please pay careful attention to what I shared today, because unfortunately many Christians today, uh, after 2,000 years after he delivered us of all curses, still many people think that they're under curses, and especially they think they're under the generational curses. So we're going to look at the scriptures today and understand the finished work of Christ on the cross. In John chapter 19, verse 30, 30 Jesus says, it is finished. And so many things were accomplished by Christ on the cross. And one among them is deliverance from curses. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, we read, Galatians 3, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse himself. Because curse be any man who hangs on a tree. He shared the glory of creation with the Father even before the world began. He left that glory and entered the world for our sake. It says in the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us, to be sin offering for us. That in, in him, we may become righteousness of God. The sinless son of God entered the world became a sin offering, delivers from all sins. The Son of God became the Son of Man, and the sons of men will become sons of God. He who was rich became poor, that we through his poverty will become rich. Second Corinthians 8, chapter verse 9. And riches today for us is not the abundance of our possessions, or the riches of the spiritual blessings in Christ. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Although some may choose to, uh, God may choose to give some people material riches so that they can be generous on every occasion. Also, he became a curse for us to deliver us from all curses. And we're going to see how this amazing grace of God is manifested in our lives, how we can live a victorious life in this world uh, by what he's done for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it is written, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The devil's work is primarily to separate man from God and inflict on man all the consequences of sin and separation from God. So we're going to see today how curses have been removed by Christ on the cross completely and different kinds of curses. First of all, the curse of the law. Curse of the law. Now when man sinned against God, he was cursed. The uh, devil was cursed. That's why God made the devil. Uh, you know, crawl on the ground, eat the dust. Third chapter of Genesis, read about that. From verse uh, uh, 5 to up to verse 14. Curses for the evil one. Curses to Adam for him to work hard on the soil and work hard for his living. And a curse for woman uh, for her to be uh, bear the chain, pains of childbirth because they sinned against God. Curse, curses because of disobedience. Now, in the same passage you find, the Lord also speaks about the freedom from curses in an indirect way. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first time the scriptures talk about Christ's victory over the devil. In Genesis 3, 15, the Lord says how the seed of the serpent will strike the heel of the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman, that is Mary, that is Christ, seed of the woman, will strike the head of the seed of the serpent. In other words, the evil one will drive nails into the hands and legs of the Son of God, will strike the heel of the seed of the woman, 
the seed of the woman will strike the head of the seed of the serpent. In other words, on the cross, Christ would destroy the works of the devil. As early as in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, immediately after talking about curses. And then you find also that the Lord gave the commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai. First 10 commandments, and then another 603 commandments in the Old Testament. And when he gave the 10 commandments in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 5 and 6, the Lord spoke about that man should not, his children should not bow down before image made by man, do not worship idols, and when you sin against God in this manner, you'll be cursed. The effect of those sins will be for the fourth and fifth generations, generations of those who hate God and obey disobey his commandments. Whereas for a thousand generations, those who love God and keep his commandments will be blessed. So blessing for thousand generations and curses, effects of sin for the fourth and fifth generation of those who disobey God and hate him. Now, based on this particular law, came this belief in generational curses. Even today, there are so many Christians who think that generation curses are upon them, even today. That's what they think. Now, actually, these commandments were given when they came from Egypt at Mount Sinai. That happened around uh, between 1200 and 1300 BC, maybe around 1275 BC. Exact date is not known. Sometime between 1200 and 1300 BC was the Exodus. Generational curses. Fourth and fifth generation will feel the effect of the sins of their forefathers. And that people hold on to that and think, oh, there's a curse upon me, generational curse. I must break that curse. In fact, in around 587 BC, when the Israelites were taken exile to Babylon, they were in Babylon for 70 years. And at that time, the prophet Ezekiel prophesied. And in his prophecy, in the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, verse 1 to 20, the Lord spoke about how the sins of the fathers will not be upon the sons. The generation curses were removed as early as sometime around middle 6th century BC, around 587 to 530 BC, sometime when Ezekiel is prophesying, or the report. 1270 BC, whatever, around that time, there was a curse. Fourth and fifth generation, the forefathers' sins will come upon the children. And then in, when Ezekiel prophesied, God said, no, the son will pay for his sins. He will not pay for his father's sins. The soul that sins will die, you will not die for your forefathers. So already on 550 BC, this was removed. And why is it that 2,500 years after that, even today we are thinking that the effect of the curse is there? Also you find, before they enter the land of Canaan, in the book of Deuteronomy, 28th chapter, read about how the Lord, through Moses, told the Israelites, they are supposed to obey God in the land of Canaan. When they obeyed God, they would be blessed. God gave them the land little by little, little by little. He won't give the land all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals will multiply around you little by little. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 21, little by little. So verse 22 also. And then God told them, when they obeyed God, they'd be blessed. If they disobeyed God, they would be cursed. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. This is the curse of the law. So from Mount Gerizim, they pronounced blessings for the people when they obeyed God. From Mount Ebal, they were supposed to declare the curses for disobedience. If you look at 27th chapter of Deuteronomy and 28 and 29, three chapters you read, there's a detailed kind of description of the blessings and curses for the people of God in the land of Canaan, pronounced and declared on Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim is the place on top of which the temple was built by the Samaritans 
compared to worship in Mount Gerizim on top, as compared to Jews who had the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans had the temple on top of Mount Gerizim. But before that, from Mount Gerizim, they pronounced blessings for obedience, and from Mount Ebal, curses for disobedience. That's what was in the Old Testament time. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. That is the curse of the law. Now, one more kind of curses are curses from the occult. The occult world can be used to put curses upon people. For example, God told the Israelites, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 to 13, and maybe no one found among you who offers his son and daughter in the fire, who practices divination and sorcery, interprets omens, engages in, engages in witchcraft, who casts spells, who is a medium, spiritist, or who consults the dead. These things are detestable to God. And because of detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out the nations before you. You must be blameless before God, he told the Israelites, and uh, don't do these things. Which meant the people living in the land of Canaan were doing all these things. So many things I mentioned there. Offering sons and daughters in the fire, practicing divination, sorcery, interpreting omens, engaging in witchcraft, casting spells, being a medium, spiritist, or consulting the dead. These are all occult practices. Detestable practices. And God told his lies, don't do these things. Why does God say don't do these things unless it was possible to do this? It is possible. Through the occult world, one can divine the future for, for a period of time. Not completely, but uh, some of the things you can know about the future. We read about that in the 16th chapter of Acts, 16 to 18. How there was a servant girl who had a spirit by which he spoke about the future accurately and brought fortunes for her owners by telling the future accurately. So through the occult world, you can do divination, sorcery, you can do sorcery on people, interpret omens, engage in witchcraft, cast spells upon people, you can do that. It's possible through the occult world. Being a medium, medium means medium between a human being and the occult world. Some people consult the occult world through a medium. Be a spiritist, indulging in the spirit conversation and consulting the dead. Talking to the dead. All these are possible. It's a real world. Spiritual world. So through the occult world, people can put curses on other people. Very, very prevalent all over the world, especially in India. There are a whole system of practices that are in certain, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, I won't, don't want to mention the name of the scriptures, where you can put spells on people, make them depend upon you, and you can give prosperity to people, and you can take away prosperity from people, all that is possible. That's occult world, casting spells on people, doing sorcery. So through sorcery and casting spells, you can put curses on people. So one said there's a curse of the law, then the curse of the occult. And third kind of curses are normal curses that people put on others, meaning wishing well for other people's blessings, wishing even for other people is curses. Cursing somebody means wishing evil for that person. Talking bad about the person. Let this happen to you. You must die. You must die in a terrible way. You will die like this. It's a curse. Sickness will come upon you. You will have a terrible sickness. It's a curse. And people can put curses on their own. Actually, if you see, they're not actually free. Uh, everybody in the world is under control of the evil one. Uh, Galatians 3.22 says, Crypto declares the whole world is a prisoner of sin. It's a fact. And people under devil's control can put curses on people, other people. And it's a, it's a reality of life. Because they want, they don't like the person, they put a curse on them. Now we read in the Bible about uh, when David 
was leaving Jerusalem and going away because his son Absalom rebelled against David. He wanted to usurp the throne. And uh, David was very, very upset. The own son is, taken, is rebelling against him. And read in the 16th chapter of uh, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 16 chapter, was 5 to 14, we read, how he, as he leaving Jerusalem and going away, one of the descendants of uh, Saul, by name Shimei, son of Gera, when David running away from Jerusalem, Shimei curses David. He was a man full of blood, and he threw stones at David and his, and his companions, and threw dirt on them as they leaving Jerusalem and going away. Because now David is in a vulnerable position. He's thinking he's going to lose the throne. Absalom is going to take over the throne. Running away from Jerusalem, while in a vulnerable position, Shemai curses David. Shemai was the descendant of Saul, and he felt that his forefather Saul, his descendants have, um, have been, been uh, actually tormented by David. David is, you know, using the power that Saul had upon himself. All they didn't realize, they didn't realize that God only gave the throne to David. He's now cursing David. And Abishai, one of David's commanders, is telling David, why don't you kill this fellow? Look at the way he's cursing you. And David is so magnanimous. So what does it matter? If God asked him to curse me, let him curse me. Maybe God will have mercy upon me and not, and not repay me for the evil, for, for the, what he's cursing me. He's not retaliating. In the Old Testament time, David was perfectly justified in reacting. Because law says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. When Shimei cursed David the king, David could have had him killed. Could have cursed him in return. Abishai says, let's kill him. David says, no. If he wants to curse, let him curse. Maybe God has asked him to curse me. Let him curse. Maybe God will have mercy upon me and not uh, let these things happen while he's cursing me. And he goes away. How magnanimous. In the Old Testament time, David is showing mercy on Shemai. And he goes away. And later on, you find God restores David back to Jerusalem. He comes back in victory. Second Samuel, 19 chapter, 18 to 23. Again, Shemai is a total repentant this time. He realizes what he done is wrong. He is coming back as king. God restored him. And Shemai goes along with a lot of people and says, I'm very sorry what I did. I sinned against you. And he's asking God forgiveness of David. Look again how David McDan is. Again, Abishai tells David, let's finish him off. He's the one who cursed you when he went from Jerusalem. He's the one who, let's, let's kill him. David says, no. Today, nobody will die in Israel. So magnanimous. So here Shemai is cursing the king because he felt that this man's a man of blood, how much the blood is shed in Saul's household, and he's going away, he's losing his throne, and I'm going to curse him. He threw dirt on the whole contingent. And so angry, but David is so magnanimous. That shows how we should be today, New Testament especially. I'll come to that later. What does him perfectly justify retaliating? He didn't retaliate. So people curse us. They don't like us, they curse us. And when we are in a vulnerable position, they curse us even more. David was a man after God's own heart. In the Old Testament time, he showed magnanimity and did not curse Shemai. And he told uh, Shemai also, you will not die. I'm not going to kill you. I know you cursed me. I'm back as king now. But I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to kill you. Today, nobody will die in Israel. So we find a lot of people putting curses on others because curses do have an effect when you're not in the Lord. Not in the Lord. Now, generation curses were removed as early as 6th century BC. The generation curses were actually prescribed around 1250 BC when law was given. Exodus 20 chapter was 5 and 6, generational curses. But the Lord said, no, 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 no. The soul that sins will die. 
a man will not die for his forefathers' sins. So law, the curse of the law was taken away as early as 550 BC, around, around 587 and 540 BC, when Ezekiel was prophesying. So there are all kinds of curses upon us, upon people in general. What about the curse of the occult? Now, when the Israelites came from Egypt and they camped on the plains of Moab, Balak, king of Moab, knew the people of Israel who come from Egypt. They are so powerful because of their God. Their power is not a physical military power. It's a spiritual power. Spiritual power. He knew that he could not contract them, even though they had a, he had a very big army, trained army. These are all pilgrims coming from Egypt. They're all travelers, weary, tired. And he, he knew that even though they're very tired, tired people, their God is a very powerful God. He can only contract them to spiritual power. So he tries to employ Balaam from Petor, who had a reputation, whom he blessed was blessed, whom he cursed was cursed. And he tries to employ Balaam by giving him money to come and put a curse upon these people. And Balaam, when he tries to go, God tells him, don't go. But then he somehow manages to go. And finally, God says, okay, you want to go, you go, but only do what I tell you to do. And Balaam goes along with Balak to a mountain top and tries to put a curse on the Israelites. Every time Balaam tried to put a curse upon his eyes, the curse became a blessing. And he realizes that these people are special people. Every time he tried to put a curse, it became a blessing. There are three different mountain tops. First mountain top, he couldn't see the, the camping properly, camping of the Israelites, couldn't see them properly. Second mountain top also couldn't see properly. Both times he blessed them. Third mountain top, he, he saw the complete formation of the camping of the Israelites. And then when he blesses them, amazing blessings. In 23rd chapter of Numbers was 23. Numbers 23, 23. He says, there is no sorcery against Jacob. No divinations against Israel. Sorcery can't work on these people. No donation against Israel. They are God's special people. He knew that. In fact, 19th verse he says, God is not a man that he should lie, son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have given a command to bless. I have blessed, cannot change it. Bala tried to employ him, tried to give him money, tempt him, bribe him to put a curse. The curse became a blessing. And he says, no sorcery against Jacob. It will not work. They are a blessed people. And go on to say something as he goes on to say. Something fascinating. I'll, I'm going to share that with you. Imagine he's on top of a mountain, looking down the camping of the Israelites. In a particular formation, they're all camped. And as he bless, uh, about to put a curse, it becomes a blessing. And then he says something fascinating. 24th chapter of Numbers, verse 5 and 6, he says, How beautiful are your tents, O Jacob. How lovely your dwelling place, O Israel. Like valleys they spread out. On top of the mountain, looking at the formation of the Israelites, the camping. How beautiful are your tents. How lovely are your tents. Like valleys they spread out. They spread out in different directions. What did he actually see from top? He saw the formation of the tents of the Israelites. You know how it is formed? There's a particular prescription for that. Numbers chapter 2 talks about it. Numbers chapter 2 talks about how they must camp. From tent of meeting towards the east, three tribes. Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. 186,400. Towards the south, Reuben, Simeon, Gad. 151,450. Towards the west, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin. 
108,100. Towards the north, Gad, Asher, Naftali. Dan, Asher, Naftali. 157,600. 12 tribes, 3 towards the east, 3 south, 3 north, 3 west. East is the longest, 186,400. Towards the south, three tribes, 151,450. Towards the west, three tribes, 100,100. Towards the north, three tribes, 157,600. On top of the mountain, how does it look? It looks like a cross facing the east. West, very short. South and north, almost equidistant. East is long, cross. He sees from top. Then what does he say? Verse 17. Numbers 24, chapter verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will come out of Israel. A star will come out. Talking about the Messiah. He sees the Messiah. What a blessing. Prophecy about the Messiah coming to the people of God. Amazing, isn't it? Balak tried to make him put a curse. Curse became a blessing, a double blessing. And a prophecy about how there are blessed people from Jacob, Israel will come out a star. Meaning the cross, Jesus Christ. So no sorcery against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Keep that in mind. Okay? So no law, uh, workers of law uh, for people of God, as early as uh, Ezekiel's time is removed. No sorcery can work against God's people because they're God's people. Now let's come to us today. The work of Christ on the cross. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 30 is written, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse himself. Because curse be any man who hangs on a tree. In the Old Testament time we read in the book of Deuteronomy, 21st chapter, verse 23, it's mentioned that curse be any man who hangs on a tree. And Christ hung on a cross on a tree. It became a curse. To redeem mankind of all curses. Now actually we see, why did they kill Jesus? Why did the Jews want to kill him? Because they felt he broke the law. He called God his father and he healed on the Sabbath day. That's why they wanted to kill him. He called God his father and he healed on the Sabbath day. Two, two, two accusations against him. And they went to Pilate and said, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says, I find no basis for a charge against him. You take him, judge him by your law. He's broken your law. He's not broken the Roman law. How can I crucify him? Judge him by your law. According to the law of Moses, the punishment for a grievous sin, offense, murder or rape or whatever, was not crucifixion. It was stoning. Stoning. The person had to be stoned. So strictly speaking, even if Christ had done a terrible sin, you know, he had no sin in him, he had done a terrible sin, punishment was stoning, not crucifixion. Crucifixion was a Roman punishment. And Pilate said, I can't punish him because the Roman law dictates that when a person is crucified, it'd be a public spectacle. It'd be along the highway. In Rome, it was the Apian Highway, it's called Apian Highway. In Jerusalem, it was a highway between Egypt and Mesopotamia, passing towards the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem, the highway from Egypt to Mesopotamia, even to, uh, to Europe. The highway will go from Egypt to a place called Megiddo, Har Megiddo, or Megadon, as we all know. And there will part ways. One will go towards Europe, highway, other way will go to Mesopotamia. But in Jerusalem, it will pass by the east of Jerusalem. All people travel, will go along that. So the cross was put there, Golgotha. Because why they put on the highway? 
as people go along the highway, they look at the person on the cross, look at the name and the crime he had committed. They're supposed to nail to the cross the name of the person who's been crucified and the crime he had committed. So they'll walk around, they look at the uh, uh, person being crucified and this person be ashamed, ashamed of himself. Everybody looking at him, oh, he's man, he's a murderer. And what look at his name? His name and murderer. They'll all scorn him, shame. They'll scorn him, oh, look at what he's done. They'll jeer. That's why along the highway. So Pilate had to put on the cross the name of Jesus and the crime he had committed. Otherwise, it's breaking the Roman law. He couldn't find any crime, not a single sin. So I find no basis, no sin in him. I can't find. Judge him by your law. But you said, crucify him, crucify him. He's a big dilemma. He wants to, want to release Jesus, but they don't allow him to release. And then someone comes and tells him, in John chapter 19, verse 12, John 19, 12, if you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar. For anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. This changes Pilate's mind. Now someone tells him, if you let him go, you are no friend of Caesar. He claims to be king of the Jews. In fact, Pilate asked him a question. Are you king of the Jews? He says, yes, it is as you say. It is as you say. So then he realized he's a king of the Jews. If I let him go, I am no friend of Caesar. Today the king of the Jews, tomorrow he'll become a threat to Caesar, opposing Caesar. And I'll be considered an accomplice of Jesus to oppose Caesar. That is why he finally agrees to crucify Jesus. And what he put on the cross? Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That was a crime. Could he be the king of the Jews? Tomorrow he might oppose Caesar. Now Caesar, I mean, Pilate's conscience is a little bit pacified. Oh, I, I'm, I'm put him on the cross because otherwise tomorrow he'll threaten uh, Rome. So on the cross, what is put? Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. But unseen to the human eye, all your sins and my sins were nailed on the cross. Colossians chapter 2, 13 to 15, it says, he made a public spectacle or against us on the cross. Public spectacle. Normally, the person on the cross, the thief or the robber, murderer, would be the public spectacle. All those who walk along the highway will look at him and scorn. Public spectacle. Murderer hanging on the cross. Jesus was between two, murder, two murderers, two robbers, rather. Other. And what he make public spectacle? Your sins and my sins were nailed on the cross. Unseen the human eye. And also, all the curse upon us, curses were removed. That's why he had to be crucified. Not stoned. If you're stoned, then no question of curse is being removed. Not only that, the prophecy in the Old Testament, prophecy, book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He had to be pierced for our transgressions. Pierced. Remember what the Lord told Satan and also Adam interacted with Satan. Seed of the of your seed will strike the heel of the seed of the woman. Seed of the woman will strike the head of the seed of the serpent. So on that cross, the evil one struck the heel of the Messiah, put nails into his hands and legs, and the Messiah struck the head of the evil one made his works null and void completely. He destroyed the works of Satan on the cross and removed all curses on mankind, on those who believe in Jesus. So no more curse for us today. In fact, John 1.16 says, John 1.16, 
from the fullness of his grace they receive one blessing after another blessing so please don't even think about generational curses upon you the generational curse is removed during ezekiel's time and made complete on the cross it is finished he said john 1930 finished every work of the devil was destroyed on the cross and god has given us today only blessings only blessings now what about sorcery witchcraft it will not work for you and me there's no sorcery against jacob no divination against israel today we are the spiritual israel second corinthians 120 says no matter how many promises god has made they are yes in christ jesus in galatians 316 all right galatians 316 promises spoken to abraham and to seed scriptures don't say and to seeds many many people but and to his seed many one person who is christ look at verse 29 verse 29 if you are abraham seed if if you if you belong to christ if you belong to christ you are abraham seed and as according to the promise belongs to christ means christian you are christian means belongs to christ if you belong to christ you are christian you are abraham seed and as according to the promise so it means no sorcery against us no divination against us made null and void now as balam said that numbers 20 23 no sorcery against jacob no divination against israel he also blessed them instead of sorcery instead of witchcraft instead of curses blessing he gave from top of the mountain below in the plains moses did not know about at that point of time later on god must have told moses what happened on top of the mountain far away because later on you find in the book of deuteronomy according to chapter verse 5 we read moses tells the israelites before they enter the land of canaan how when balaam tried to put a curse the curse became a blessing because god loves you so today we are the recipients of god's amazing love to the cross he loves us so much and therefore when anyone tries to put a curse upon us be it through occult world or even like shemait put a curse on david people curse us when they try to curse us the curse becomes a blessing because god loves us that is why today as god's people we don't curse people when they curse us we bless them because every time someone puts a curse upon us god is changing the curse and making into a blessing don't fear the occult world the occult world fears us those spirits see christ in us have noticed sometimes in a public place when you go a public public place you find some people look at you in a very uh, an angry way with hate you know them they don't know you at all you think you're in a bus you're in a market some looks at you uh, angrily and they mutter something they mutter some curses on you have noticed that you know why it happens is because that person could have been filled by the evil spirit and the they see christ spirit in us and we are the smell of death to those who are perishing second corinthians second chapter 16 says we are the fragrance of life to those who are saved and the smell of death to those who are perishing and they curse us they they show hate towards us because they know where they are going we are a reminder of where they are going smell of death even devil is like the smell of death that's why people hate you don't be surprised in 1 john 3 13 on rights to christians 1 john chapter 3 verse 13 don't be surprised if the world hates you 
Because they know where they're going, they know where we are going, and they hate us. Devil hates us because they're going to heaven, he's going to hell. He knows more about heaven than we know because he came from there only. So does hate. Understand that. Don't bother about the devil. The system will flee from you. The occult world cannot touch us unless God allows the devil to touch us for some reason. Like, for example, he took every possession of, of Job only after God gave him permission. And God knew how much Job loves uh, to obey God. Blame is upright, man who fears God and shuns evil. God's omni loving, omnipotent, is a personification of love and full of power. So when it's all powerful, all loving, whatever he does for us is always the best. So trust in God for that. Trust in God, he always does what is best. Don't get carried away by what people say about you. They curse you, look down upon you. You know, if you look at the Old Testament time, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, 21, 22, we read, from Solomon writes, don't pay attention to every word people say about you. Don't pay attention to every word people say about you. For you may hear a servant curse you. And you know many times, you also have cursed people. You also have cursed people. Go for making believers. What is cursing? Wishing evil for somebody else. Oh, this happened to you. I'm going, I'm going to punish you. Would this happen? You're going to suffer. So curses. Many times, involuntarily we have cursed people. We have wished wrong for other people in the past. Maybe. I don't know. So, God says through his word, do better than every word people say. You may hear a curse, uh, your servant curse you. And you know you also curse people. Don't pay attention to all that. Just walk in the ways of God. And what do people do to you? They curse you, you're getting a blessing. If one person puts 100 curses on you, you're getting 100 blessings. Why not give one genuine blessing back? You know, Bible says, bless those who persecute. Bless those who persecute. Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you and pray for those who curse you, who persecute you. First chapter of Matthew, verse 44, 45, love your enemies and bless and do not curse them. And the question comes, I don't feel like blessing people who curse me. I don't feel like it. You don't do things because you feel like it. You do things because you obey God. God asks you to do it. When God gives a commandment, you do it because it's a commandment, not because you feel it. If you feel like doing and you do it, it's not obedience. It is you are you feeling like doing it. You don't feel like doing and you do it because God says that is obedience. The Lord says, love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. First Peter chapter 3, verse 9. First Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult but with a blessing, that you may inherit a blessing. So this you were called to inherit a blessing. Don't repay evil with evil. Curse with curse. Insult with insult. But with a blessing. For, the, for this you are called to inherit a blessing. When you bless people who curse us, when you bless people who insult us, when you bless people who do harm to us, we are inheriting a blessing from God. God loves to bless us. He said, no, you bless them. When you bless them, I'll bless you. What an amazing joy it is to receive blessings from God. First Peter, chapter 2, verse 21. To this you are called, since Christ suffered for you, leave you an example, you will follow in his footsteps. When he was insulted, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entered himself to him who judges justly. The Father in heaven. When people do harm to us, what do we do? We entrust them to God. What does Jesus do? He entrusts himself to God. He entrusts himself to him who judges justly. So when people do harm to us, you entrust yourself to God. God, let me respond the way Jesus responded. I will repay evil with a blessing. Insult with a blessing. In that process, 
receiving a blessing from God. Don't go by feelings. Go by the Lord's instructions. By faith we obey. Obedience comes from faith. That's why when people say, I know I must do this, I don't feel like doing. You don't do it because you feel. Because you don't feel like doing. Like for example, uh, forgiving people who do harm to you and uh, forgetting their sins. Why should I forget? I don't feel like forgetting. Well, because God says, as simple as that, forgive as the, God, as the Lord forgave. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Forgive as he forgave. When God forgives, he forgets. So the same way, thank God for the fact that every curse was removed on the cross. Generational curse is completely gone. Also it says in the book of Proverbs, 26 chapter verse 2, Proverbs 26 2, like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. We are undeserving of curses only because we are washed by the blood of Christ. We are made perfect. We are God's children. Please never forget your identity in Christ. Every sin in our heart has been cleansed by his blood. Our hearts are purified by faith. The sprinkled blood cleanses from a guilty conscience. Hebrews 10, 22. Our hearts are made perfect and therefore we are undeserving of curses. God is for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? So let put, people put curses. It's becoming a blessing. That's why I say, when people put curses on you, speak well, bad of you like Shishma did to David. Abishai told David, let's kill him. He's speaking against the Lord's anointed. You are God's anointed. King, you're going back now thinking you're going to lose your throne. And he's taking advantage of that. He's cursing you. He's throwing stones at you. Throwing dirt on us. Let's kill him. David says, no. Maybe God has asked him to curse me. Maybe. Maybe God will have mercy upon me. And God did have mercy. Lesson for us. Everything in the Bible is for our learning. So when people do harm to us, bless them. Pray for them. Because our enemy today is not people. Our enemy is a devil. The devil uses people to trouble us. Our enemy is a devil, not people. So differentiate between the person being used by the devil and the devil himself. Person being used by the devil, you pray for him. Lord, he does not know what he's doing. This is what Jesus prayed for people who put him on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. They were instruments of the devil. They don't know what they were doing. They are pawns in devil's hands. So many people are pawns in devil's hands who trouble us. Pray for them. Resist the devil in flee from you. Pray for these people. It's like, you know, when uh, uh, for praying for people who trouble us, who do harm to us, how do we pray? I pray that they come to know the Lord more intimately. We forgive them. Don't hold the sins against them. And how do you actually pray? I tell them, Lord, the harm this person is doing to me, I won't do to anybody now. Maybe early I would have done when I'm not a believer. I won't do anyone, that to anyone now. Because I know you so well. You love me, Lord. I love you, Lord. We are close. So I, I can't harm anyone. I can't do any harm to anyone. It's because I know you so well. If this person knew you the way I know you, he won't do it, Lord. So, Lord, reveal yourself to this person. He's speaking, harm, uh, speaking harm, uh, harmful things to me, about me, slandering me, doing harm to me. He won't do that if he knew you so well. Reveal yourself to this person. When you pray like that, that person may not change, but you will change. You will change. You will know God is pleased. He's very, very pleased with such a prayer. You know that? Do you ever wonder whether we are pleasing God by our prayers? Are we pleasing God with our prayers? Are we praying only for material things, blessings, or are we praying for Obedience to him, to be like him, 
to please him. Through our prayers, we can please God or displease God, disappoint God. When David asked God for wisdom, or no, sorry, Solomon asked God for wisdom, it says in the Bible in 1 Kings 3rd chapter 9 and 10, God was pleased Solomon asked for this. And God tells Solomon, because you asked for this, did not ask for long life or wealth or death of enemies, I'll give you what you asked for. He asked for wisdom. Solomon pleased God by asking for wisdom, not for other things. Similarly, when you pray for people who are troubling you, Lord, bless them, Lord. Give them revelation about yourself, Lord. If they know you so well, they won't do like this, Lord. Such a prayer pleases God. And when we please God, we have the joy of the Lord. The same joy he had, we'll have. So when you walk in his ways, the joy Jesus had, we will have. My joy will be in me, says. John 15, 11. I've told this, that my joy will be in you. My joy will be in you. He spoke about peace. Told you the thing that in me will have peace. In the world you have troubles. And joy will be complete. Peace will be complete. So simply obey God. Whether you feel or don't feel, doesn't matter. As when it comes to curses, thank God for the fact that all generation curses have been removed completely. Curse of the law removed on the cross completely. No curse can have an effect upon us today. And sometimes we think that, uh, okay, my forefathers' sins are upon me. May not be curses, but maybe those sins are in me. I can't come out of it because they're forefathers' sins. Certain qualities my daddy had, I have. He had because my grandfather had. It's hereditary. Well, I got good news for you. Don't have to continue on sin. In First Peter chapter 1, 18, 19, we read. First Peter chapter 1, 18, 19. It's not with perishable things such as silver or gold. You were redeemed. You were redeemed. Past tense. From the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers. But the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So when certain traits are there in your parents or grandparents, don't think you're going to have it. Because by the blood of Christ, we've been redeemed from the empty way of life and it don't do to us by our forefathers. Praise God. Praise God that he's removed everything on the cross. It is finished, he said. Now, there are some people today, some preachers who say, when you say some problem I've got, oh, it's a generational curse. You come to me, we'll break the curse. Who are you to break the curse? Already broken on the cross. By talking like this, they make people depend upon themselves. They make people depend upon them. You come to me. I'll break the, break the curse. We'll pray. One week fasting we'll do. One, every Sunday come to me for the next four weeks. Or the four weeks curse will go. Nothing like that. Already broken on the cross. Thank God for the work of Christ on the cross. In fact, more than five years before Christ, general curse are removed completely. Don't have to pay for your father's sins. You have to pay for your sins. Even that today, we don't have to pay. He has paid for us. Can you imagine that? Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. He took away punishment, gave us peace. What an amazing work of Christ on the cross. That's why you're doing this series on the cross. Cross is not, not just about going to heaven when we die. It's about enjoying that life here. Enjoying a life free of curses. Completely free of curses. You know, I've got a lot of stories personally from my own side to talk about this. Freedom from curses. Don't have time, maybe sometime I'll share. I just have one particular incident. My granddad, my dad's dad, was a very famous lawyer in, in Salem. He was a Rajaji's contemporary, Rajagopal Chari's very close friend. And he went into politics, Rajagopal Chari, freedom fighter he was. My grandfather was a lawyer, a criminal lawyer, as they called him. Actually, I would say not a criminal lawyer, a lawyer who defends criminals. There's a big difference. Not a criminal lawyer, a lawyer who defends criminals. Very famous lawyer he was. And the reputation in, in Salem that whenever anyone wanted to commit some murder, he'll tell his friend, let's go finish him up. 
அடிச்சு போட வந்துடலாம் ஐயர் கிட்ட போயிடலாம் அடிச்சு போட வந்துரு ஐயர் கிட்ட போயிடலாம் ஒர்க் <laughs> and they put a curse so much so my dad's uh, siblings the 13 of them born the 10 uh, lived for a long time a lot of problem among them the legal case court cases property matter disputes terrible things happen in the family but the grace of god only my dad's family immediate family they kept away from all that protected because i realized even though i didn't know him then the lord knew me from foundation of the world he made sure none of the curses would be having effect on us in every way we blessed our family of course i'm praying my rest of the family to be saved some of them are saved now but it's amazing to know that no curse can have an effect because we are protected by the name the name of jesus and by his blood we've been cleansed of every sin there's so many example like that in fact there was a prophecy to the occult world that uh, one year after my uh, marriage to go to my wife's horoscope within one year after marriage the husband will die 1979 january 29th i and rani got married and i came to know about this uh, particular star horoscope that she had that within one year after marriage husband will die so i'm supposed to have died in 1980 what happened in 1980 i got born again instead of dying i got born again God has a sense of humor. No? Real sense of humor is God. People say, I'm going to die. God says, no, I'm going to new life. Eternal life. Praise God. So in my life, I can say, by, just by the grace of God, nothing but the grace of God, without me breaking any curse, <laughs> you don't have to break anything, but believing God's promise, but believing what he said, we are insured from all effects of the evil one. Luke 10, 18, 19, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. For all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. No occult curses upon us. No sorcery against us. No divination against us. Undeserved curse will not come to rest. Generation curse removed long time ago. Finally on the cross, he became a curse for our sake. I mean, people curse us today, it's becoming a blessing. Can you imagine how you are pampered by the Lord? Just believe what God's word says. Don't go by all the preachers who say, come to me, I'll break the curse. Who are we to do something God has not already done on the cross? It's finished, he said. We thank him what he did on the cross. We are recipients of the amazing grace. So I'm going to pray now for us, not to break curses, but to have faith. Faith to believe the promise of God. Faith to believe the curse has been broken completely. They can experience the blessings of God. John 1.16 From the fullness of his grace we receive blessing after blessing. There are many Shemais who curse us today. Forgive them. Pray for them. Bless them. In the Old Testament time, during the law, when there was a law, David did not retaliate. He could have said, I for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You curse me, I'll curse you. He said, let him curse. God will have mercy upon me. How much more today we should be carried away by what people say about us. Thank God he is for us. So I'm going to pray for all of us that we'll take this word very, very seriously. Thank him for redeeming us from the empty way of life handed on by forefathers. No generation curses. No occult curses. No curse of people upon us. Nothing will have an effect on us. Only blessing, blessing, blessing. God loves to bless his children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank and praise you, Lord, for each one of us, Lord. Worship you, Lord. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Lord. Give us faith, Lord. We want a gift of faith, Lord. Faith to believe what you have said, Lord. We only want to have to believe what you have said, Lord. You have done it on the cross, Lord. It's finished on the cross. I thank you. I praise you, Master. Pray with all my heart for the people, who are, Lord, who are watching this, Lord. And those who are going to watch on the, on the peak, Lord, Lord. Lord, they will understand, Lord. It's finished on the cross. You've given us blessings, Lord. Let not, let not the devil fool people and, and deceive people, Lord. We have been set free 
when the sun has set us free, we are free indeed, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for no curse can have an effect upon us, only blessings upon us, Lord. Give us faith, Lord, to believe what you have done, Lord. And I thank you and praise you, Master. Our life is a life of faith. Help us live by the Spirit, live by faith, live by the Word. I pray for every one of us, Lord. Even now we'll experience this freedom in Christ, the joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord. Going fully well, Lord, we've been set free and we can choose to live a life of victory, Lord, and enjoy your kingdom, Lord. Kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit and power. Come at all of us in your hands, Lord, to the word of your grace, Lord. I thank you, Master. Hearts are filled with thanksgiving, Lord, for amazing grace, Lord. We can't even begin to fathom this grace, Lord. Worship you, Lord. Thank you, Master. I pray that this message will go on to many people, Lord. And those who heard it, Lord, will absorb it, Lord, take it to heart, Lord, and share with people, Lord. Give them the words to go and share, Lord, that uh, your, your children, Lord, live a victorious life, Lord. We want to give you all the glory, honor, and praise, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.